So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this community conversation and specifically the topic on the alcohol curbside and delivery and potential impact on youth and much more to be learned and, and shared and um, explored today. And we're really grateful for everyone who's on, especially um, some invited folks who have helped to create uh, the resources we've developed, but we're very grateful for everyone on. We know time is valuable and to ask someone to be on another Zoom call is, uh, is a lot, especially on a beautiful day. So much appreciated for folks are here. So just to uh, answer that question, the trivia, I know lots of folks who are on already. Oh, oh some more folks are coming in. Uh, there are a couple more folks coming in. Do you wanna get a last minute guess for the trivia question? How many alcohol licenses, licensees are currently issued in Lamoille Valley towns? So I see we have a couple of responses, 50 and 55. So we actually recently did this search and it is 207. Yeah, yeah. So, so Jessica, can you move to um, the next slide? So I just wanna let folks know that we are recording this and we're doing that um, because we know in these times it, it's hard to have uh, everybody on at one time and lots of people have all different things going on. There's the agenda. And we wanna be able to use this in different ways. So it will be recorded and it will be available um, for our, on our website. And welcome Skylar, thanks for being with us. See lots of folks coming on. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we'll do some introductions. I have an introduction of Healthy the Moyle Valley for folks who are, aren't connected yet. Uh, I'll frame our conversation and, and we'll look at the community, um, our the Moyle Valley scan and impact. Uh, look at what currently the Department of Liquor Control is seeing and uh, compliance checks and what they have to share with us, some um, valuable information from our guests. And then we'll um, get into really the, the bigger part of this conversation, which is what can we do to address the risk factors? And specifically the two risk factors, two main group categories are access and availability of alcohol for youth and the um, town norms in a town and the the laws the policies so i want this to be interactive use your chat box for sure i know folks are on the phone so i believe if you want to talk it's star six is that correct yes so if you want to talk please jump in uh this is not uh, this is a conversation so don't want everyone to uh to stay quiet and and so use the chat box and also star six to unmute yourselves so I'm Allison Link. I'm the Policy and Community Outreach Coordinator for Healthy the Moyle Valley. Glad to have folks here to talk about this. Uh, I was on a webinar, a national webinar on this topic, and then it just evolved in conversation, bringing the, the national information back to Vermont and specifically the Moyle Valley, and uh, had conversation uh, with Jessica Bickford, our coordinator, who, who you'll meet in a few minutes, and um, Jen Fisher um, from the uh, Department of Liquor Control. And we then took off and included also Mich Michelle Salvador and Seth Jensen. Michelle's from our um, Vermont Department of Health and our local prevention consultant, and Seth Jensen, um, the principal planner from Lamoille County Planning Commission. And we're just so grateful for all of that collaboration because we couldn't be doing this without all of, all of you folks out there. So I'd love to just uh, hear who folks are on the call and just to share. So um, I'll, maybe I'll call on, on you so it's easier and, um, and uh, we'll come around. And I think I'll end with Jessica so then Jessica can talk a little bit about our coalition, Healthy the Moyle Valley. Jen, would you, can we unmute you to introduce yourself first? Hi, um, my name is Jennifer Fisher. I'm a training specialist for the Department of Liquor Control and I would, uh, Love to hear more about uh, everything. So interested in the conversation that we're going to have today. 
Great. Thanks. How about we go to, is it Jonna Shepherd? Yes, I'm Jonna Shepherd. I work at Capstone Community Action here in Morrisville and uh, just happy to be here and part of the conversation. Thanks for being here. Uh, Mary? Oh, wait, you have to unmute yourself first. Okay. Um, so I'm Mary Donnelly. I'm with a neighboring coalition. I'm with Central Vermont New Directions Coalition down in Montpelier in Washington County. And um, I'm just here to, to learn also. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. We love our collaborations with uh, our colleagues across the state. Uh, Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle Salvador. I am a substance misuse prevention consultant at Vermont Department of Health in Morrisville. And um, I cover the Lamoille Valley region. And um, basically I work with uh, consulting with folks in the community that are interested in doing um, substance prevention work. Thanks. Lana? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Lana Sword. I am a licensed graduate professional counselor. Um, and I actually just uh, came on because I wanted to learn some more information. Great. Thank you. Glad you're here. Uh, Eric? Uh, yeah, let me see. <laughs> Resign. I'm uh, Eric Volk, also with uh, a colleague with, with Janet, the Department of Liquor and Lottery, uh, Education Coordinator, and I'm here to, uh, to learn as well, and, uh, and interesting to hear the different perspectives, and, and I always learn from Jennifer, so <laughs> very happy to, to be online. Yeah, she's a gem. Thanks for your support in this again, Jen, Michelle, like all the effort you put in. Uh, Skylar, welcome. Can you introduce yourself? Are you available? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks for being on. Wow. I'm happy to be here. I have kind of spotty internet, so I won't turn my video on. I apologize. But uh, I'm Skylar Janess. I'm the Chief of Compliance and Enforcement for the Office of Compliance Enforcement, Department of Liquor and Lottery. Uh, happy to be here. I got an invite late yesterday from Jennifer. Glad to see these conversations going. I also sit on the Substance Misuse Prevention uh, Council, the newly formed council set up on the government. So I try to keep as uh, close of a finger on the pulse of what's going on across the state in these in these areas as possible. So happy to be here and uh, we'll turn it over. So glad to have you. And I know that um, we had said it before, but uh, you know we are recording this. And so I think it's really valuable, um, everyone who's on the call, uh, to be able to you know share out this information once um, and you know, once we have our conversation, but I'm looking forward to it. Well, Jessica Bickford, please introduce yourself and Healthy the Moyle Valley. <laughs> uh, good, after, good, good afternoon and thank you. Um, Jessica Bickford, I'm the coordinator of Healthy Lamoille Valley. And for those of you who may be new, uh, Healthy Lamoille Valley is our substance prevention uh, coalition. Um, we are a new uh, drug-free communities grantee, but our work is not new. We've been uh, serving the region under various names, but uh, for the last 22 years, this work of prevention has been going on uh, within the Lamoille Valley. So our service area is uh, Lamoille County and then the greater Hardwick area. And uh, we're excited to be here today and offering this uh, workshop and conversation. Um, and we have uh, a lot of more information on our website, which is healthylamoillevalley.org. And uh, please check, check it out, so thank you. Great. I guess I should also check, is anyone else out there? No, I think we're good. Okay, so we can move on. Thank you so much for introducing uh, yourselves, everyone. Oh, I see a pet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. He says hello. Hello. Uh, Jessica, can we have the uh, move to the next slide, please? So why are we having this conversation is the main question right now. So as we know, uh, in Vermont, uh, the governor's executive order, uh, Directive 4, allows for a curbside pickup and delivery of alcohol, uh, which also um, a part of our conversation will be the, there's the potential of the increase of outdoor consumption licenses being, um, being requested. And so 
it, with more, um, with this executive order, we think about the, what will happen or what has happened. So the main risk factors that we look at are the in increased access and availability um, of alcohol in the community and the norms shifting. Um, you know, with these laws were established and, uh, you know, for a reason. And now that they've changed um, quickly and without um, folks having time to be thoughtful about, very thoughtful about implementation of how to do it, um, norms um, towards alcohol use are, 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 are in, in flux and, and shifting at right now as, as we're having these conversations. So this leads to potential increased youth use and potential earlier use of, earlier onset of use. And that's really why, we, why we're here. You look at the data just in Lamoille um, County, and um, Lamoille County has higher levels of um, data shows 20% of Lamoille youth drink before the age of 13 compared to 14% of uh, Vermont youth across the state. Um, and we also know that uh, nationally, youth who use before the age of 15 are six times more likely to develop dependency in their lives than those that use after the age of 21 because the, the brain's not done developing until 25 years of age. And, and when we look at this um, you know, national and local data, it's concerning and, and that's, why, uh, you know, that's why we're here. So when we think about um, the main question to address, it's you know, we understand that um, some adults drink alcohol. And yeah, but how do we in the Lamoille Valley and do folks, you know, across the country who may be dealing, um, you know, with this new phenomenon, um, how do we make sure that when we are selling, serving, advertising alcohol, that we're not also contributing to increasing risk factors and increasing youth use? Uh, and making this data look even more alarming. So how can we do these things simultaneous? Um, you know, our field is prevention, substance misuse prevention, and it is research-based. And, you know, we basically focus on uh, identifying the risk factors and protective factors for youth that prevent or delay use. And so in our conversation today, we're really honing in, as I mentioned before, on access and availability, you know, what this executive order does to access and availability and um, to the community norms, but also the potential for uh, community laws and policies as well and, and what we can do as a community um, in these times and what we can do to move forward thoughtfully. So that's the framing. And does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, so next slide, please. So this is a part for participation. Um, you know, just on a personal level, since COVID-19 came into our lives, what have you noticed on a personal level related to alcohol, you know, through a lens of your personal life? What have, what have you noticed related to alcohol, about alcohol, just from, your own experience. You can uh, say, raise your hand or unmute yourself to jump in. Go ahead, Mary. So um, online, um, there's a, like a lot more um, people um, talking about um, alcohol as a like a coping mechanism, like mm -hmm. and how early can I start drinking and. Yep. You know, all just all different kinds of things like that, and um, a lot of groups getting together around uh, drinking. Um, you know, um, happy hours um, when they might have just been on Fridays. Now they're like any old day of the week kind of a thing. So just a lot more visible drinking, and I guess because it's maybe it's online and before it wasn't. But um, I'm thinking particularly of my um, whole bunch. I have a whole, whole bunch of second cousins, my first cousins' kids that are all younger than I am, but they're, you know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have another person who just joined us. Welcome. If you can identify yourself uh, when you have a moment, that'd be great. And since you're on the phone, it's star six to unmute. Oh, thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, what else have folks seen? I mean, some of us are professionals and in the field, but even on a personal level. Oh. Sorry, it's Maria Davies. I was having a technical difficulty. Maria Davies. Oh, Maria, hi, welcome. Welcome. It's, this is Allison. So sorry, I had, to, I had to go through the phone because I could not get the Eventbrite ticket to work. So I'm on oh, the phone. Oh, no. You know, maybe, um, Jessica, can we just send her the link? Are you out of computer, Maria? I am. I'm oh, great. I'm at my uh, Vermont.gov. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll uh, do that for you. Great. I mean, so you can stay on the phone for now until we get you get you hooked up. Uh, but, you know, I was saying, um, Maria, we're bringing people in uh, to the conversation um, as to talking about what we notice um, just through a personal lens in our personal lives, like where we notice a shift or what we notice about alcohol since COVID-19 came into our lives. So, you know, anyone's oh, welcome to, to share from, you know, we're, a lot of us are professionals in the field who are on the call, but also this is a personal question. Anyone right. else? I, I, I haven't seen per se alcohol abuse because um, everybody's so secluded in their houses. Um, my kids tend not to go out too much. And if they do, it's usually during the day to a local watering hole. Uh, what I have seen is the vaping and things like that because I see the kids out on the street, you know, walking around with a vape. Yeah, yeah, I know that that's definitely on our agenda uh, to work on as well. Um, and and so, isn't, yeah, go ahead. So Someone. I I was thinking I have noticed um, a lot on social media, on Facebook and on Instagram, um, a lot of memes about drinking, I, I recall one was kind of like a bingo board. You had a full up, like a COVID bingo. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, referred to how it's appropriate to drink at any time of the day. Um, oh, wow. I have noticed um, people, uh, I, I've noticed people that I know that have mentioned, you know, having um, a drink with their lunch because they're working at home. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, uh, you know, fairly more prominent than um, non-COVID times. Yeah. So I was talking to one of our, our local liquor store owners um, the other day, and she was sharing that, you know, where people were often coming in for a, a fifth, they were coming in for a half gallon. Uh, and so people seem to be stockpiling uh, more liquor. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed that TV commercials have ramped up. The alcohol commercials just seem to to ramp up, and it's like there everything is now a sparkling beer or sparkling water, and they don't mean sparkling; they mean alcohol added. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just carbonated; it's all got alcohol added. Everything. And they're commercial after commercial after commercial. Yeah. Uh, it's good to hear what folks are seeing out there. I was on the um, one of the bike trails in the Lamoille Valley with my kids and, and passed by a movie theater where the sign was saying curbside, curbside, pick up your, your, can, your movie candy, but also had a martini glass uh, on the sign too as to pick up your alcohol here too. I took a picture, thought, and talked to them, you know, sharing about it. But, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, and reading the newspaper, local papers, and the big advertisements of uh, folks doing curbside, that's that's some of the things I've seen. So what, are, you know, let's change it. I mean, we're already talking about the second question there. What, what do we notice through the lens of the community? But, like, take that on the macro level now. Like, what... What do you think, um, what, you know, what have, else has had anybody noticed on that level, the whole community level? We can also start getting into it on, you know, just like the next, the next slide, we'll just move into it because it relates to a Lamoille Valley, Lamoille Valley scan um, and what we think the impact is. So just when you scan the restaurants in our area or and, and bars in our area, or how many how many establishments are doing this and what they're doing, um, you know, what do what do folks know or what have you heard? What's what's going on out there? 
and feel free folks who look for uh, who who are joining us from uh, liquor control you know to share as well but you know we can see what what others um, have heard or or know as well I think we're definitely seeing more expanded outdoor seating yeah We've got big boulders in the street now expanding mm -hmm. into the parking and and uh, also folks applying for the license licenses. Which means then, you know, to take it further, that means then alcohol being able to, you know, be served there while people are walking on the sidewalks and, and, uh, or curbside or delivery. You know, we've seen uh, as some of the resources that we've shared, um, you know, we've, we've, we've heard a lot that's, that's been going on. Um, related to um, you know youth and youth being served and or youth helping parents sitting in the front seat pick it up holding the alcohol while they're driving away you know uh, you know lots of other um, examples that that have come out I, I think one of the things that is important to think about is that the outside consumption piece is still a process where it's licensed Mm -hmm. where they have that that communication in some form with our department in their town um, as opposed to the curbside pickup piece where that is that's allowable now but there's you guys are exactly. might be a, a much better um, gauge of how much that's in your communities because mm -hmm. it's not something they need permission from us to do Right, and that's a very, very good point. Um, and you know, and we've talked about a little bit how, when this came on, you know, folks are the the businesses are trying to stay above water, and you know, they're they're trying to figure out whatever they can and take the take take this um, executive order and try to go go with it. Um, but you know, we're trying to have folks slow down a bit and say like, let's think about. Um, you know, how, how, to, how to do this as, you know, Jen, this was one of your main things of like, how do we do these, these um, things thoughtfully? And that people have say, community members have say, towns have say, um, you know, there, there is um, potential for, for more in our resources when we get to that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it some more. Um, so do we want to hear from, can we hear from Jen and then uh, Skylar or Eric, if you want to jump in? Oh, what do I see? Jessica's adding, seeing a lot of businesses creating drinks with more than one drink per to-go container. Yes. And jugs, even. Yes. Uh, so, Jen, do you want to maybe take it from here a little bit on, you know, the the initial compliance checks and what's happening in the field now. And I know Skylar was, I was on a call with you the other day as well. Any of what you want to jump in on, what you're seeing, your experience, uh, and what you think the impact is? Um, I think I'll just mention, and, and this is information that I know Skylar has put out, our enforcement division has um, looked at what what the impact of these, these things are, keeping um, a mindful being mindful of how um, how youth is getting access in this time because as businesses are trying to uh, stay afloat, make a profit, they have these options they've never had before. Um, and I, I know they have done some, some compliance checks around curbside specifically because that has been something that they had not um, had the option to do. We have a retail delivery permit where stores are allowed to do um, some delivery. That's a specific permitted thing they, that stores would apply for, that it, it has rules about hours and locations and even amounts. Uh, but with the current executive order, there was an allowance to let businesses be able to figure out a way to have a profit in a very odd time. Um, so looking at some compliance checks that um, Skyler and um, investigator Giotti also did, uh, or Sergeant Giotti did, where they checked a couple of businesses specifically doing curbside and six out of eight of those um, did not check 
IDs. And Skylar, if you wanted to speak to that specifically, because those were checks that you did. Yeah. Maybe Jessica, can we share um, Skylar's um, graph yeah, here? Or yeah. you know, I can. Yeah, I did. Skylar, we'll, we'll, I we'll try to share that. <laughs> That'd be great. I threw a picture in the chat. Uh, that's just some Lomoyo County specific data. Uh, and that is, I just want to clarify that that is tobacco compliance checks that we've done since the institution of mm. this, uh, the state of emergency. So just uh, following off from uh, Jen's um, point on the curbside compliance that we worked on, we decided to take an opportunity to collect some data on this paradigm, fully understanding that uh, these businesses certainly are seeing um, expanded abilities, they're seeing potential opportunities to increase revenue streams. So we fully anticipate to see legislative changes in the next sessions, making the uh, making the these new paradigms memorialized in statute. So giving them the ability to do curbside alcohol sales, to do expanded delivery uh, options. And ultimately uh, the department really feel, felt like we needed an opportunity to test these conditions uh, so that we could provide some data to the legislature and, and just let them know whatever ultimately the legislature decide is right for Vermont. Here's, here's some of the risks and challenges that we would see. So uh, we did institute a curbside compliance check uh, it was a, a definitely a break from the norm of our alcohol compliance checks. Our minor did wear a mask. Our minor was encouraged to socially distance. We did have to accompany all of our alcohol orders with food purchases, which meant uh, it was a rather expensive round of compliance checks, as you could imagine. Uh, but uh, we did we did see what we were a little bit concerned we would see, and that was uh, frankly a, a fairly dismal uh, compliance rate. Again, it was a small n. Uh, simply because a lot of the challenges of uh, the costs associated with it. And then additionally, not every license is engaged in uh, curbside uh, pickup, especially early on. These, these were checks that were done in uh, early May. Um, so uh, like Jen alluded to, out of eight checks, six did end up furnishing alcohol to our minors. Those checks were also Chittenden County based. Again, it was the highest cluster of licensees who were engaged in this type of retail at that point in time. Uh, but what it what it did for us is it did a couple of things. One, it uh, further elevated our concerns about youth access in this uh, paradigm. And then secondly, it certainly um, told us that there was room for common sense regulation if these do ever uh, make it into statute. Uh, so it, it, we were thankful to get that data. We have since uh, restarted wholesale, our compliance program. So we will likely be collecting some data in Lamoille County in the great, or in surrounding areas. Well, again, you see uh, the capture that I did throw up there. She just made it so I could share. So I may have to reshare that file again. Uh, oh, I can share my screen. I'm not much of a, a Zoom user. Give me two seconds and I will try and share that screen to show some Lamoille County data. Yeah, there you go. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm just well done. Jump. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to jump over to tobacco compliance and you can see it's filtered from the start of March uh, to uh, the, our most recent round of checks, which were actually the 16th and those were in Lamoille County. So these are very contemporaneous and you can see our tobacco compliance rates for even for this round of checks uh, here are 75%, which is uh, that's to me, this is always aberrant. We pretty much are a very consistent statewide and almost community, community by community we hover around a 90% compliance rate. Uh, we, we get concerned, 90% frankly is concerning because that means one out of every 10 checks is furnishing uh, uh, prohibited products to our minors. Uh, but generally, what, that's what we see across the state. Um, anytime we see uh, 80%, we, we start to raise eyebrows and sub 80% uh, tell us that we have a problem. Uh, in that particular area. And this is generally a trigger for us to start allocating more resources in that area. So I know I heard a couple comments about seeing more vaping. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that aligns with some of the data we have. It seems that we're, we're, we're losing a little bit of the um, compliance that we would normally have in this area. And if I expand out Lamoille counties just to a larger 
sample size covering uh, a normal a more normal time you know you see it up at the 84 if we go back into february of 2019 and then if we scale this back to all of the data we have for lamoyo county we'll see that 85 percent is uh, the you know uh, the average of our compliance rates for tobacco in and around generally lamoyo county area so we are deviating from that norm even in this short period of time. Uh, and I, I'm a big fan of data. I think it paints pictures for us of, uh, yeah. of problems. And, and this is a perfect example of that. I wish I had some alcohol data. I think that, that will be coming shortly, uh, looking at curbside delivery. Um, but last plug is this is all public data. So this is hosted on our website. And I hope that everyone is familiar with how to use this. And uh, I, again, I think it's a helpful tool. Thank you so um, much. It's really a yeah. fantastic uh, resource that we all have access to. And for bringing the tobacco data in, um, you know, even on this call, you know, we, we, we are uh, working on substance prevention uh, across the board of substances and, you know, mainly alcohol, for those who don't know, alcohol, tobacco, um, marijuana. And so it's very relevant. And also what we can, what towns can do um, and some of the resources we have for towns and also the retail, the retail environment uh, resources, uh, this, this all plays in and, is, and it, we're not really only talking about alcohol here, even though this is the executive order is specific to alcohol. Thank you so much. Can um, I ask, Allison, can I just ask Skyler yeah. um, or Eric, how Please. often are the compliance checks done? I, I mean, I know they're done. I just don't know how often they're done. And the second part of my question is, what happens to those individuals or those entities that are selling uh, to minors that are not, not even checking ID? What happens to those people? Do they get uh, some type of um, penalization or something or other? Or did they get their license revoked? What happens? A warning? Yeah, I can cover that real quick. So uh, the short answer to the frequency of how often checks occur, uh, we are mandated by law to check every single tobacco license in the state at least once. So uh, those happen on a, on a fairly frequent basis and, you, and I can guarantee you that every tobacco license in Lamoille Valley will be checked. Alcohol, we're not statutorily mandated to do. However, we fully believe in this paradigm and painting a picture of issues across the state. So we, we do them, uh, quarterly and investigators have to do 30 alcohol compliance checks in their assigned areas every quarter. I wish I had enough investigators to say I've got one dedicated only to the Lamoille County. Unfortunately, I don't have those resources. Uh, investigator Ross is generally assigned to Lamoille County, but he also covers uh, Washington as well. Uh, so usually at least quarterly, you'll see some alcohol compliance checks done in and around Lamoille County. Uh, as far as penalties go, uh, for both failures of our tobacco and alcohol compliance program. Uh, there, is a, there is a penalty schedule that is available on our website. Uh, first sales uh, on behalf of the licensee is a warning for both alcohol and tobacco. And then there are uh, monetary penalties on a sliding scale uh, on subsequent failures uh, for that licensee. Additionally, we also hold the individual clerks responsible uh, for the failing and uh, of that compliance check in the furnishing of alcohol to minor. And that's done by a hundred dollar fine for the first offense. Uh, and that's, uh, there are other associated penalties that may come up if they actually don't even check the ID at all. Uh, there is a potential another waiver penalty that gets issued. Um, but, uh, there's a, a number of different ways that a compliance check can go, but generally we take an educational and warning approach for the first sale and then subsequent violations are our uh, monetary penalties eventually leading to loss of license as a potentiality. Right. And that's great. Thank you for that feedback because I, I am speaking to a lot of um, representatives that are running right now, both for um, governor and lieutenant governor. And, you know, I have conversations with them. They want to know what's going on. So I don't, I don't see the alcohol abuse um, in each household, but I'm sure there's stuff going on. Um, so it's known as a party town where I live. Um, and I want to communicate that to them, but this is important information for me to communicate that, you know, that it's, it is going on, it is on the uptick, and how they can help, you know, how they can change legislation, or how, how is it that they're, they can help you, support you by giving you more investigators, or whatever the case may be. So what would your message be to these people that are running for these um, public office? 
Uh, my message would be that there is good data out there. Uh, it does take some work to seek it and find it, uh, but I think that all decisions should be uh, uh, data-based. Um, and uh, if, if, if anyone, certainly anyone has questions about good data around alcohol, uh, send them my way. I, I can talk for hours about it and would yeah. love to share it with them. And I, I think also, um, you know, Maria, with uh, all of our work, we are also very uh, data based and bringing that in and however we can support the local towns, you know, with getting that data. I know the YRBS local data is coming very soon and, and other information that'll be useful. Um, so, so we'll be helpful with that. Another thing is on the, you know, with, with, um, with the compliance checks and folks who don't pass, uh, we often follow up and I guess with COVID-19 haven't done as much in, in that area um, recently, but I think that those are areas where we continue that education and that relationship. We have some resources specifically to support folks and I, and I should add that to the conversation. So maybe let's, uh, thank you. Let's move on to the next slide and like uh, kind of moving, moving forward a bit. Yeah, you know, just moving forward to, okay, so this is all kind of what's going on and, and but what can we do to create an environment that protects our young people? And, you know, as Skylar said and others like, you know, this is temporary now, but it's possible that there'll be a push for permanence down the line. And so, you know, what what are what information are we gathering and uh, and what can we do whether or not um, that permanence that push for permanence actually becomes permanence and how do we do this all thoughtfully um, you know it's also we don't know about our marijuana legislation what's going to happen but how to help towns and how to help communities also think about any changes to our current uh, laws and policies how we can have a thoughtful local process um, as well as a statewide process and so I want to talk uh, have Michelle Salvador do you want to jump in on any of this I just didn't want to move forward without you Michelle, about norms or creating that environment that protects young people? I, I will jump in if I see anything. I think it's okay, just, perfect. Um, okay, perfect. yeah. Okay, so Jessica, the next slide, please. So a lot of the work we've been doing recently that's come, that came out of uh, all the conversations between uh, Jen and Jessica, myself, Michelle, um, Seth Jensen from uh, Mall Planning Commission, uh, are these resources. So we have a few resources for towns that you um, have had the link, access to the links, but we'll look at that, uh, couple them together. We also have a resource for the retail and restaurant environment of uh, some best practices. And um, also we worked alongside uh, folks in the community getting feedback from some select board members and also from the restaurant and breweries to kind of compile this so that it makes sense, these resources make sense for, um, for everyone and have input from everyone. And we kind of have this conversation uh, about uh, nothing about us without us. And so including all different stakeholders in the process. So I think I'm, Jessica's gonna have to, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to share my screen now uh, to show you uh, the first resource. And, and if you have it, uh, also, you can you can take a look yourself, uh, you know, on your own screen. Oh, well, that wasn't the one I wanted to look at first, but let's try this one. Uh, what do folks see? Do you see alcohol, curbside, pickup and delivery? It says resource one of three. Yes. Do folks see that? Yeah, great. So, you know, basically, this is a resource that you can share in your communities. Mm -hmm. um, it's something, it's just an overview. The first part, what you need to know, we already discussed this. Uh, the second part of the first page, impact on youth. Youth, we also, and youth use, we also talked about this part. But what I wanna get to in this resource is your town has a say. Uh, you know, many people even Whoops. Even select board uh, members don't often know that they have the ability to create rules and policies that support prevention. And I think that's that just that idea itself is valuable that people who uh, parents in communities, you know, that the youth in communities, that the leaders themselves know that they can have some say and they should be empowered to make some change. And it may not be that they have full power, but there are nuances that can make a huge difference. And that's really valuable. So, 
you know, as we look here, you know, what do we want to encourage? What can towns consider right now? So to have some of these conversations up front, um, this, you know, Jen, it was great having your input because you were saying this point, you know, repeatedly, um, you know, how to acknowledge the changes and the impact that maybe folks aren't taking that, you know, stopping to, to think or talk about it. Um, and what potential future changes there might be to alcohol, tobacco. I mean, we, we uh, Skylar, I was going to ask you actually about the tobacco, like what Tobacco 21, the data changes, I haven't really looked at with uh, Tobacco 21 coming into effect. We can save that for another time. But, you know, there are changes that are happening. Uh, there may be a ban on flavored tobacco products coming up. There's the pending marijuana uh, commercialization. So there's a lot going on. And how can we have some of these conversations up front? A lot of our towns um, have not are not at that point um, as a town talking about, you know, what, even if you look at town plans, it's possible to have a whole section on uh, wellness and um, substance prevention and youth development, but um, it's not a required category of a town plan, but many towns are starting to include that and that's part of our work. So having these conversations up front is so valuable. And to think about, uh, you know, what kinds of messages are youth getting about substances in our communities that normalize towards substance use. Um, and, and I'm in the process of uh, updating one of our main resources um, as like a kind of poli uh, town policy toolkit of what people in towns can do around um, these issues, but how to help people notice and see through a prevention lens and to see where substances are being normalized. Michelle, do you want to talk to this? You're so good at speaking Just to that point. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the key is we are so um, accustomed um, to seeing um, substances and hearing people talking about, um, you know, alcohol, marijuana within our communities that it just kind of becomes the norm. And I think we, we sometimes don't notice it. And, um, we know, though, that really community laws and norms are some of the, is one of the most powerful risk factors that impacts young people and their um, decision um, to use at a really young age. And I think what, you know, what we all have in common is that we want young people to grow up and make healthy choices. And, and the science, as Allison was covering earlier, it shows us that when young people are using, when their brains are still developing, they um, they change the neural connections very early on, and you know, in their brain development, and this predisposes them for um, later um, dependency issues in their life. And our numbers are very concerning in Lamoille, and so it's it's important to know that prevention happens at all these different levels. So it happens at home in our families. And it happens at school and it happens, um, you know, in our communities, but like the really big powerful level that it happens on is in our environment. And so, um, you know, when you go out into your communities, um, start taking a look around and just start making a mental note because sometimes we don't know until no, right. We don't always pay attention to what's happening in the communities because we're just so conditioned to seeing it. When you go out, and you start noticing, like I um, noticed with my own son, who's 12, I started noticing how he took the community in and the different times he would talk about substances. I remember one time going to um, the farmer's market and um, there were sodas you could get that looked like they were in beer bottles. And he wanted to hang on to that bottle as he walked around because he thought that looked cool. Well, he didn't get that from growing up um, in my house. I mean, I, I don't drink beer, but he picked that up from growing up in a culture that does, um, you know, glorify and um, shows young people that this is cool, this is a positive thing. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. It's really sure. valuable to hear your experience. And I'm sure we could all give examples, but I like that um, push to folks to say, ah, just look, you know, take, take notice. Um, it's helpful in our own in our own way. Do our community scans. Uh, so some of what el what else we can do, um, or to help um, 
help towns understand that they have that possibility is to adopt some interim zoning or, or towns that don't have zoning uh, ordinances that would be substance free uh, public and open spaces or limit the number of servings that can go in a to go container or you know they're limiting toilet paper in the supermarket so you know how do we just think about uh you know this 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 is an opportunity for towns to say oh what do we want what is our vision for our town with respect to health and wellness what do we care about as a town um, where do our youth, um, you know, fall in our priorities and in our choices we make as a town and that we do have the choice. So, you know, that's part of what the rest of this uh, first one of the town resource collection uh, talks about, um, you know, and, and just uh, here some of the other resources relate to this point of considering how to deal with an increase of requests for outside consumption licenses, um, but also all licenses. And you know that a select board can be kept involved. Sometimes a town clerk just pushes them through and it, there's no, um, there's no, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there, there's not a check-in uh, about oh, it. Nice. It's just, they already had the license. So the renewal process just kind of flies by. Um, but we've created some resources here, like um, resource three is all about things people can think about around the renewal process or a new license process. And I encourage you to take a look at that one. We're not gonna look at that the details right now, but so many different kinds of ideas of like, what's the license being applied for? Or what, uh, what licenses might they apply for down the line? Do we know, have an idea of where this business thinks they're going right now? Um, you know, what's the outlet density or, you know, how many of these uh, licenses do we have in a certain area? And um, are the kids in that in town walking by every day back and forth from school? Um, what are our policies in our parks um, when youth are playing or or all the time around substances? Um, you know, and how do they, how do we, what have have these uh, the licensees done it with respect to training and there are required trainings but what other uh, training might they offer their staff um, there are so many different things that relate to licenses that towns can ask and we can empower towns to ask certain questions so that's resource three um, resource two is looking at specific questions that relate to again more details of what towns can do um, can they consider limiting delivery parameters um, and curbside pickup for for the curbside pickup or delivery can they limit the number of servings can they think about it, the public spaces around their um their establishment and think about how someone leaving with a drink that might impact uh the park down the block or the neighborhood in general um, to have folks really look at what the signage is and how much advertising impacts uh, the community and what youth see in particular. Uh, the adver so much advertising comes at us in so many different ways, but what does, it, what does a, um, a young person see when they walk in somewhere? What are they absorbing? Look through their eyes, really, is, uh, is something that we can consider. Um, so we're, the second resource is looking at policy considerations to help think about all these types of licenses and um, permits, as well as general strategies that towns can consider around all substances. And um, so these three resources are, for, uh, in particular, community-based, focused on town, um, town policy ordinance, um, empowering them to, to just have the education and to know what their possibilities are. The other resource that we've been getting into the community is this one. Oh, there we go. Here we are. Um, I have to reshare and here we go. We call it a to-go connector and can folks see this one who are who are on? Yeah. So yeah. again, this is specifically for what retailers and restaurants, what they can do and what they need to know. I think we had talked to Jen and this was probably around that May date. 
and saying, wow, there were six of eight um, you know, who, were, who were checked, um, did not pass that, that compliance check. And so how can we help folks think about it? So you can see here, and we've been getting this into the community with another initiative we're doing now, but you can see the general categories that related to photo IDs, um, making sure to do the online training, like which of their staff have done it. And sometimes, you know, you have different people in the, um, you know, working in the restaurant uh, and maybe they hadn't done a training for the uh, original license. And again, anyone jump in here who um, has more information. Um, you know, just different ways that are best practices for our restaurant bar environment that first class license in particular uh, of how to help them think about it. Um, you know, what it means for a to-go drink order, how to think about the policies that may, they may put in, um, customers, farmers, markets, et cetera. So it's really valuable that we're engaged with not just the towns, but the restaurant environment, the bar environment as well, because we're, we're really here for the whole community. This is a community effort and um, whatever that we can do to support our community in substance prevention and protect our youth uh, is what, um, what we're here to do. So getting this information out there is uh, extremely valuable and um, you're all on the call to be able to discuss this. And, and now that we have these resources, they're hot off the press. So <laughs> you're all here, you know, so I see folks nodding. I'm curious now, you know, this is a nice size group on the, uh, on the call, but, but where do we go from here? Um, you know, we've shared these across the board, but uh, what, what opportunities or what suggestions do you have and what questions do you have? So Allison, are you, are you distributing these uh, around the communities or have you done that already? Um, yes, we are distributing them around the community. I'll let Jessica talk a little more to this because it's joined with another initiative that we have. And I see I have some of my family members who are coming to say Yes, um, and my dog is going nuts. So um, these actually just got mailed to um, the restaurants. So they went out at the, the very beginning of this week, um, as well as with a kit. Um, so they had a little log book in there. Um, and so they had a series of the stickers. Uh, they ended up, I think, getting uh, 50 of the, the stickers that could go right on the, the cups. Um, and the number to request more of those. Um, and so those went out in the mail, they should be getting them either yesterday or today. Um, and then the other sticker, the rectangular one is a sticker shock sticker. Um, and typically that's something we would do in partnership with law enforcement, uh, with youth uh, going into the stores and the adult would take the alcohol out of the cooler and put the stickers on. Um, because of COVID, we're having to adjust that a little bit. Um, we have uh, parents and youth can go out together um, and we have some directions on how to do that. Um, we always check with the store first. Uh, we don't just show up and, and ask to sticker. Um, and so we were able to do a Riverbend Market last week. Um, and so those went on like 12 packs and, you know, uh, the flavored uh, like twisted teas things that might be more attractive to youth um, just to kind of get that message out there um, we dropped some off at Stowe liquor store because they were willing to have their staff put the stickers on um, so if you know of a, a store that you'd like to see those um, definitely uh, contact us and we can we get the book ask if you if you have a contact in the store see if they'd be willing to partner with us and then we can get you the stickers um, to either get to the store or uh, go, go out and help put those on so uh, my dog's going nuts <laughs> thanks for the, the question um, anyone else thoughts questions you know where where from here So this is targeting the retailers and the liquor stores and, and people like that, but it's really good information also for parents to understand. I, I suppose I want to make a, a connection between the people that have really embraced this, the businesses that, that have embraced this and have said, yes, I'm willing to do this and to follow these rules and to, you know, make it known that you're entering a business that is following the rules and that will ID your children you know, how do, how do we, how do we do that? You know, is there a sticker that they can put on their, their 
their uh, window that says, you know, I follow Healthy Lamoille Valley. I care about our kids. That type of thing. Wow, that's that's great. I'll I'll, I'll let Jessica. I'll say one thing. I'll let Jessica take it from after. But um, like we have a couple of initiatives that. Um, that are specifically with retailers, um, the retail environment. And we ha we've started in a way like a, uh, a Lamoille Valley prevention um, kind of business list of, of folks who are you know, really connected to us. Um, we do do, as Jessica's putting out here, the retailer recognition. So we put ads in the paper every quarter for those businesses who have passed their compliance checks. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, you know, there's this 3450 campaign, which there, um, which relates to tobacco, but um, it's, there are three behaviors that lead to four chronic diseases that lead to fit over 50% of deaths in Vermont. So the three behaviors are um, poor nutrition, lack of physical activity, and uh, tobacco use. And lead to four, uh, four chronic diseases, uh, heart and lung disease, cancer and diabetes, which then lead to more than 50% of deaths in Vermont, and it's actually higher in Lamoille Valley. And so that initiative is across uh, really any stakeholder group um, from a faith-based institution to um, a college campus, a school classroom, a retail environment, an employer can take on the 3450 initiative to say, you know what, these are behaviors we can help change and we can do something about it. So um, when people do sign out for that, sign up for that initiative we do recognize them as well um, so I think I don't know Jessica do you have something to add yeah just real quickly with the retailer recognition uh, each of those retailers also gets a certificate um, that many of them choose to display right behind their counter uh, and so uh, that's something you can look for um, and in non-COVID times, we have youth sign those certificates um, and often deliver them um, because it's really exciting actually for the, the store owners to kind of have, have students coming in and saying, thank you, what you're doing is important. So it just kind of reinforces that. Um, the other thing is that um, we're always looking for ideas and would love to start um, a community action or parent group. Uh, we do have a coalition uh, and we have, you know, starting to have more regular meetings there. Um, as well. So there's there's lots of opportunities to get involved and I love your idea of, of a, a, some sort of sign or sticker that we could put right on the door, you know, partnering we care about kids or, or something like that. So uh, let's brainstorm some more on that. Thank you. Yeah, I love that too. Um, you know, and it, and it was, I went last year with the People's Academy middle school students to deliver certificates to the same stores where they had actually done a photo voice project of like, where did they see big tobacco advertising? And, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was quite moving um, for the, the store owners to hear from them how much they valued like a specific store didn't sell jewel anymore at that time. Um, no flavors at that time when it wasn't banned uh, or, you know, there wasn't the limitation. So, uh, yeah, it was really great. The, what I want to end with um, is here, and I want to share my screen just one more minute, is related to, um, where is it? No, it's not showing. I want, sorry, I'm hoping, did my screen, my screen did not share yet. Uh, Let's try this one. Apologize. Let's hope it gets there. No. Let's see. Ah, uh, clicked me off. Okay. I'll try one more time. Screen share. Here we go. Okay. So what I want to leave with is the the very bottom of the resource one. Uh, you know, just some some key things to kind of. Uh, to leave with in a, in a way and each individual in a town can make a difference we live we live in a place where the, there are select board meetings we have town meeting day it's very easy to walk into a select board meeting for community concerns or not walk in right now but come on for a uh, you know for the zoom conversation and there's a lot that we all can do to educate our own um you know leadership in our own individual towns and um, and that we can. So these are resources. I put in the chat box the link of how to get there. Also through Healthy Lamoille Valley, we have on the right side of our website, um, it's basically our news and events and our blog post. And so the second one down right now is the one that is uh, all about this topic. But really, um, as Skylar had talked about and so many of us, really seeking out the local data and however we can help folks access that data, it's part of our mission and, and getting it out in the community, but to make decisions based on 
on data and keep helping folks to go back to that. Uh, I live in Morristown. Lots of us uh, live around in the Lamoille Valley, but some do not uh, or work in and or live elsewhere. But, you know, it does matter what neighboring municipalities are doing. We're all connected. Someone who lives in Morrisville going back to Hardwick or what, you know, or to Johnson or to Waterville, you know, this, we live so close that this impacts all of us, all of our um, norms, all of the, the access and availability and the policies in each of our towns. And so, um, you know, just to keep that in mind, it really does matter what other people are doing, take note. And, um, you know, we say here in a way, make stronger restric restrictions first and then reduce if needed, just in the way of thinking thoughtfully. Um, often we jump in, but I think the main point is how do we make changes in a thoughtful way? Um, how can we acknowledge what is happening and have these conversations up front and to be doing what we're doing now? And I'm so grateful that folks have, um, have joined us in this conversation and I just hope to expand the circles and that um, we continue to, to, uh, to do just that. Anyone else? Final thought or comment here? Okay, well, this, vid this recording will be shared um, at some point. And thank you to our Green Mountain uh, Access and our thank you. Yes, thumbs up. Yep. And so that is wonderful. We'll be able to have this aired. And thank you again to Michelle Salvador and Jen Fisher and Jessica. Um, for working on this project um, with me and Seth Jensen, who wasn't able to be on the call, Skylar for jumping in and being so present with us and supporting our efforts. And uh, we're grateful for what the work you're doing out there. And for, you know, the folks out there who have been on the call, you know, thank you for joining us from other neighboring coalitions because we are all connected. People don't just stay in one, you know, health district area and parents and people work in the community. It's great. Uh, Maria, Jana, Lana, you know, great to have everybody here. Great resources, great work, Allison, Jessica. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Night. Thank you. Night.